After a longish break from, from our online events here at the Dialogue Society, uh, we're excited to have a rich panelist lineup today with Dr. Richard Race as, as chair, followed by several speakers, um, Professor Paul Thomas, Professor Hazel Bryan, and Adam Long as our speakers uh, in the event titled Evolving Dialogues in Relation to Fundamental British Values and Prevent. I'm Maisha Aaron, a project coordinator and research fellow here at the Dialogue Society. Now, I said this is our first event in, in a while being, being online, but that's not because we've been lazing around. Um, we've actually been doing a lot, but it's, it's kind of hidden behind the scenes. Um, both our volunteers and our, and our interns have been working tirelessly throughout the pandemic. Um, and that's on a lot of community-based projects as, as well as research projects as well. So we had our Ride for NHS fundraiser over the summer. Um, which we brought, you know, communities of, of cyclists from across the UK together to um, cycle for, for a fundraiser. Um, we're, we're currently in a partnership project with, with the charity Time to Help um, in developing a project called Talking Bubble, um, which will be centred around the theme of loneliness and, and bringing together those who may be lonely within society to, to a friend over the phone. Um, and that's something we're, we're looking forward to. And we've had food distributions to, to vulnerable communities throughout the UK. Um, and, and now we're planning our upcoming interfaith and intercultural iftar events. Um, we're fortunate to be joined by, by several interns over this period as well, um, working on a couple of research projects. Uh, one of the, the main ones which we're really excited and, and our panel's coming up next month is uh, actually a contribution that we're planning to make to, to the Commission on the Status of Women at the UN. Um, and that will be, you know, a collection of, of panels that we did over the past year in relation to women empowerment and kind of bringing the information together and, and the efforts of all those panelists and, and converting that into a policy paper to have present and in a form of, of a single panel uh, at, at the UN mm -hmm. over in March. So that's something we're really looking forward to as well. Um, we're also kind of working on, on a COVID impact report and how BAME communities were impacted and then what that translates to uh, when, when we talk about and think about the impact in, in community relations, you know, if, if we're talking about perhaps people losing, losing trust in government. And I think, you know, that was kind of translated over into to the vaccine scare monitoring that, that was unfortunately, you know, prevalent in, in some communities that we saw um, over the past weeks. Uh, so we're really excited for that report as well. Um, and we also managed to kickstart our career school program. Uh, which provides 50 asylum seekers and refugees uh, from, from backgrounds from law to teaching to, to medical fields. And, and we kind of provide essential trainings and, and courses to help them achieve, you know, um, practi practitionership in, in those fields here, here in the UK. Um, so, so they're kind of the recent things and, and how we are um, as, as the Dialogue Society. And we're kind of looking forward to, to developing these further in, in the upcoming months. But nevertheless, it's, it's lovely to be connected with you um, virtually, uh, at least for now, hopefully in, in the upcoming months and, and as we'll see as, as everything unravels uh, in our office once again. Um, but without further ado, I'd like to pass on to Dr. Richard Race from, from the University of Roehampton, uh, who is going to be chairing the event tonight. Um, so Richard, the, the floor is yours. Mm, sure. Um, good evening, everybody, and welcome uh, to uh, the Dialogue Society's event entitled Involving Dialogues in Relation to Fundamental British Values and Prevent. And on behalf of the Dialogue Society, I would like to welcome Professor Hazel O'Brien and Professor Paul Thomas, um, both colleagues at the University of Huddersfield, uh, who will be talking um, on their research and their application of research to ongoing issues in relation to um, FBV and prevent. Um, 
I'm going to chase Adam. Hopefully, Adam Lang uh, will be here. Uh, I did have contact with him a couple of hours ago, so I'm sincerely hoping that he can join us at some stage over the next hour <laughs> to talk about his PhD uh, research on on prevent. So, as your chair, I will. When Hazel begins uh, in a couple of minutes, I will be chasing him to hopefully find out that he can participate later on um, with his 20 minutes. The structure of this evening's session is that both Hazel and Paul and hopefully Adam will have 20 minutes each um, to talk about their uh, views on FBV and prevent. Um, and uh, we will have a Q&A session that both uh, myself and Lysha will uh, moderate and hopefully we'll, we will um, have your inputs uh, into tonight's uh, session. I just want to um, just very, very quickly talk about why um, I'm chairing an event uh, with the Dialogue Society on this issue. Um, I come at it from, from three points. One is a practical point. In the next two weeks, ironically, I will be teaching both fundamental British values next week and the week after um, prevent. So in that sense, I have a practical uh, interest in what my colleagues are going to say in relation to these areas of interest. Again, I have a research interest in these two issues as well. So I try and um, combine research and teaching and teaching and research um, in the sense that I'll be scribbling notes down, not just for the next couple of weeks, with professional practice, but beyond that in relation to future research interests. Um, I'm also interested, and I know at least one of the talkers tonight is going to be talking about the prevent review um, that is, is coming. Um, and um, the final point, I think that's my three points, so it's two and a half perhaps, but I think uh, I will stop there. So I have a research and a professional interest in this. And again, with organizers of the Dialogue Society, um, we're interested in organizing another event later on in the year. I talked to uh, colleagues in the Dialogue Society about this. I know that there are interest groups and not just academics here this evening on YouTube. So in that sense, if you are interested in participating um, on a future event within the Dialogue Society on the issues that we're about to address, then please contact me uh, or the Dialogue Society expressing your interest. And hopefully you will have the opportunity to talk here in a future forum in the future. Uh, 20 minutes colleagues uh, for your presentations, as I've said, 20 minutes each. Hopefully I'm going to try and chase Adam up and see whether he can join us tonight. I'm hopeful that he can. Um, so without further ado, let me hand over to Professor Hazel Bryan to start the proceedings this evening. Hazel. Thank you so much, Richard. Can you hear me? Yes. Great, okay. Um, I think that my first slide is going to appear any moment um, and hopefully you'll be able to see me as well. I only have two slides this evening. Um, so good evening, everyone, and thank you, Dialogue Society, for this invitation. My presentation this evening draws on four bodies of work. First, my book, co-authored with Professor Lynn Revel, titled Fundamental British Values, Radicalization, National Identity and Britishness, the cover of which is on the PowerPoint slide. Second, a forthcoming book written again with Professor Lynn Revel and Professor Sally Elton Shalcraft, titled Prevent in Education, Teaching in an Age of Extremes. Third, again with Professors Revel and Chalcroft, a study which was the first of its kind to research the impact of fundamental British values and prevent on initial teacher education. And fourth, the first study of its kind to research how head teachers were navigating the prevent duty statutory requirements in the early days. And again, that was with Professor Lynn Revel. And so, schools are our Republican crucible. They completely protect our children in the face of all religious symbols, religion. So said President Emmanuel Macron back in October in a speech delivered to launch the new offence of separatism. A speech entitled Fight Against Separatism, the Republic in Action, set out Macron's concern that a counter society has developed in France, where separatism is part of a politico-religious project pursued by Islamists. 
And this drive by President Macron aims to address behavior that does not represent or align with what he terms Republican values. Entitled A Law Strengthening Respect for Republican Values, Macron wishes to ban separatist behavior in society. And in his speech, he gives the examples of, in hospitals, women refusing to be treated by male doctors, or in transport, men requesting to work on all male teams. In the speech, Macron made clear that he felt government had let this happen. Nous avons nous-mêmes construit notre propre séparatisme. Nous avons créé ainsi des quartiers où la promesse de la République n'a plus été tenue. We have created our own form of separatism. We have created districts where the promises of the Republic are no longer kept. Referring to the banlieue, Macron felt in particular these were fertile soil for Islamism. So why, you may ask, am I opening a presentation on prevent and fundamental British values with a quote from President Macron? Well, it's because his thoughts on separatism echo the words of former Prime Minister David Cameron at the Munich Security Conference in February 2011. Prime Minister Cameron used the conference as a platform to address some of the issues that had been simmering continually and erupting sporadically in England since 2001, noting, and I quote, segregated communities behaving in ways that run counter to our values and proposing that, quote, frankly, we need a lot less of the passive tolerance of recent years and a much more active muscular liberalism. The Munich speech, as you will know, sets out what a person should do in order to be a citizen, speak the language of their new home, be educated in a common culture and curriculum, undertake the national citizen service at 16, take pride in local identity. Articulated here was a conscious attempt to define what it is to be an integrated citizen in a liberal democracy today. And this is arguably a significant moment in which muscular liberalism takes shape, bringing to the fore discourse on Britishness, religion, the secular state, cultural values and social mores. And of course, the teacher's standards play into this new muscular liberalism by requiring teachers to promote fundamental British values within and outside of school. So too does the prevent duty, which builds on the notion of muscular liberalism to place a statutory duty upon education professionals to act as key agents in countering radicalization such that teachers become both policy subjects and policy actors in schools. I'm now going to offer three observations on prevent and fundamental British values. My first observation relates to what is going on in classrooms. Prevent, it could be argued, has the potential to influence how educators construct pupils. And Heath Kelly's concept of the pre-crime space is helpful here. Applied to education, this is the space where teachers might, post-11, view pu pupils as having more or less propensity for radicalisation, as more or less inhabiting a pre-crime space. And this, of course, has the potential to have a significant effect on the psychological contract between the teacher and the learner, in which trust is the cornerstone of such relationships. Related to this is the concern that teachers might be inhibited from discussing issues of radicalisation in classrooms. David Anderson QC drew attention to the vulnerability that teachers can feel. On the one hand, they may fear misrepresenting issues if they aren't well enough, to, well enough informed. And on the other hand, they may misunderstand what a young person is saying and then have the anxiety of dealing with a potential prevent referral. And these are not concerns confined to the UK. In France, MP Anne Geneva of the right-wing LR party has promoted the position that it should be an offence to inhibit the work of the teacher. Commissioned by the Jean Jour and Charlie Hebdo Foundation and conducted after the murder of French teacher Samuel Paty in October last year, EFOP published survey findings in December demonstrating that self-censorship has been increasing in French teachers since 2018. 
So in classrooms, there are potential issues of teacher vulnerability where teachers may feel inhibited from managing discussions and potential issues relating to the positioning of pupils in a pre-crime space and the need for pedagogic skills to manage this well. My second observation relates to radicalisation and the construct of the vulnerable. And here I'm stepping away from the classroom context of teaching and learning and focusing in particular on teachers' understandings of the processes of radicalisation. The bombers who perpetrated the suicide attacks on the 7th of July 2005 were homegrown, born in the UK, they experienced a Western liberal childhood and youth, including an education characterised by a national curriculum, and yet they had become radicalised. The concept of radicalisation to understand the forces that give rise to terrorism began to be used following the attacks against the United States on the 11th of September 2001. And whilst this approach arguably held the promise of an objective analysis of events following 9-11, some, such as Kandnani, argue that approaches to understanding and addressing radicalisation were always highly influenced by policymakers rather than perhaps experts in the field. A range of influential theories to explain the disposition of the perpetrators have emerged since 7-7, such as the cultural psychological predisposition developed by Walter Lecure, which focuses on the psychology of individuals, on fundamentalist religious beliefs, on anti-Western attitudes, aggressive youth culture and segregation. Other influential theories include notions of radicalization as, if you like, a theological process championed in particular by Gartenstein, Ross and Grossman. A third influential theory, the bunch of guys model developed by Sageman has an emphasis on kinship, childhood friendships and personal networks. And Kundanani proposes an additional model rooted in political dissatisfaction, arguing that radicalization may not necessarily be religiously inspired, but may be a form of political dissent. A focus on the individual whether through religious affiliation or psychological attachment to take those first theories, psychological attachment to friendship groups, casts that individual as vulnerable and makes it possible to legitimately place them under surveillance in school. And this approach casts those at risk of radicalization as individuals who have maybe fallen under the spell of religious fanaticism or lost their identity within a, solution, within a social group. The process of radicalization that may lead to terrorist acts are presented in this way as individual narratives that can be counted. And thus the soft power of education has been identified as one vehicle through which an alternative narrative or fundamental British values might be developed and developed at a young age. Perforce, teachers and other education professionals have become central actors in this endeavour. Equipped with a narrative of fundamental British values, teachers are key players in a political discourse of Britishness. And a key observation from our research is that whilst teachers may have a neo-narrative of fundamental British values and a statutory duty to prevent young people from becoming radicalised, they also, many, have limited knowledge of the complex processes of radicalization. My third observation relates to values, fundamental values, national values and national identity, all of which are in play in the requirement to promote British values inside and outside of the classroom. The notion of Britishness and national identity have never been addressed with such intensity in education as they have in recent years. Education has been used repeatedly as a resource to develop a sense of nationhood. And in that sense, the requirement to promote a model of Britishness through the curriculum is not unusual. We see this in other countries and through curriculum subjects. But what is new is both the politicized nature of the values associated with Britishness and the securitized context within which schools now operate. In education, we continue to experience tsunamis of change where constantly changing policies and new initiatives have become the norm. 
And it is amidst this shifting landscape that a discourse on the role of national values promoted and cultivated through education has emerged. All schools must now demonstrate that they promote British values. They produce policies and examples of how the values are met through the curriculum and wider activities and ethos of the school. And organisations that relate to all areas of education, unions, professional bodies, resource hubs, dioceses, national associations, now routinely produce their own guidance on how their members and users can promote British values. And of course, these resources act as micro technologies of policy. They are in and of themselves securitized. Two events confirm the status of fundamental British values as the major factor in the way schools now engage with the issue of national identity and values. The Trojan Horse Affair, where some academy schools in Birmingham were subject to investigation after an anonymous letter to the Department for Education alerted officials to the possibility that governors and teachers were promoting an extremist agenda. And this marks a turning point in what has come to be termed the securitization of education. The result of this was widespread fear and confusion about the nature of religious freedom in schools and even the function of public education. The second event was the aftershock of the Trojan Horse Affair, where 35 no-notice inspections were carried out, acting as a signal to schools that fundamental British values were not only to be taken seriously in schools with Muslim pupils, they were to be addressed rigorously, rigorously by all schools, Christian or Muslim, academies and community schools alike. Apologies, Hazel. Two minutes. Two minutes. Thank you. Thank so you, thank you. how should we promote national identity and Britishness in schools? And what are the issues we need to grapple with? We can turn to the fall of the American president and the spectacle that has played out before our eyes on January the 6th, earlier this year, where President Trump rallied a group of people a mixed group of people, the Stop the Steal rally, that quickly evolved swiftly into a mob comprising right-wing populist rally goers, as well as conspiracy theorists, right-wing nationalists and anti-government militia groups, such as the Proud Boys and members of the Oath Keepers militia, neo-Nazis and the Three Percenters, among other organized groups. What played out here was a fascinating image a fascinating and incredible image of the different um, uh, makeup of groups that challenge um, the ways in which we can understand what is the norm in terms of values in society and what is on the edges of society, how people are enacting these uh, particular values and beliefs. The emergence of homegrown right-wing paramilitary, paramilitary groups in America is deeply situated within American history and recent American political history related to the farming crisis of the 1980s. Now, if we step back and wonder and ask ourselves, how can these images that we've been faced with help us to understand what's going on in the British context, Homie Barber can help us with this. Is our national identity to be found in the battles that we fought, the flags we flew, the dragons we slew, or rather a narrative interrupted, if you like, by the profusion of voices of a richly diverse society. So what does it mean to be British? Whose images and whose voices are privileged? If you could just turn to the second and last slide, that would be really helpful. In our forthcoming book, we refer to the prevent effect. And in this, we argue, that there are three domains that in concert with a prevent duty have particular consequences. And you will see that these are the construct of the vulnerable, the rise of nationalisms and the chilling effect. I've touched briefly on each of these this evening and I hope that in doing so, I've offered you some rich perspectives on prevent, fundamental British values and national identity. Thank you. That's great, Professor Brian Hazel. Thank you. Um, again, it's not just about Britishness, is it? It's about America. It's about other countries um, in all of it, all of their rich histories and tapestries. Indeed. Um, and in that sense, I think you've given us a great start to this evening's event. So thank you for your input. 
welcome to Adam. Um, and thank you, thumbs up from Adam. Um, uh, welcome to um, the event this evening. I swiftly hand over to Professor Paul Thomas um, and his uh, presentation this evening. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Thanks, Richard. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's good to be here, have the opportunity to talk to you. Um, what I'm going to do is um, hopefully build on some of the themes that Hazel's um, introduced. And by doing that, I'm going to I'm going to focus on research that I carried out with colleagues, which was the first national study of how teachers in English schools and colleges were actually understanding and implementing the prevent duty after its introduction in 2015. Um, and what what the, the evidence said about the way they were implementing and particularly look at how they understood and were enacting fundamental British values. So that's going to form the main sort of bulk of the comments I want to make tonight. But I want to sort of put that in a bit of context. Context. I want to start by saying a little bit about the evolution of the prevent strategy as a whole. And my reason for doing that is um, we're in a period, as Richard indicated, where prevent is once again very controversial, is, is in the media because of the prevent independent review and the new reviewer and reactions to that reviewer um, but I suppose a general comment as someone and I, I've been researching prevent ever since his introduction in 2007 um, a general comment is that the recent debates in public about prevent uh, often don't reflect the way that prevent has very significantly changed and evolved um, I think it's important to acknowledge what that evolution has been and what it involves, what, where it's come from and what it now seems to focus on. So I want to say a little bit about that. I want to share the main findings of the research um, with you, and particularly their implications around not just fundamental British values, but what it suggests about doing um, education against extremes and what it asks of educators and I'd like to finish with some brief comments about the review process itself and particularly what it represents for educators and the role of education in preventing extremism so I've got a small number of slides I'm going to just share my um, share my screen now uh, if I can and um, let's, sorry. let's go to slideshow So um, let, let me first say something about the way the prevent strategy is actually developed. In, in, in my book in 2012 and in subsequent sort of articles about prevent, I've, I've identified um, a number of distinct phases in prevent. I've talked about prevent one and prevent two and then how the prevent duty is extended and developed the prevent two phase. So. Prevent One, from its introduction through to 2011, was very much about community-based activity. Schools and colleges really didn't feature at all in Prevent activity. It was overwhelmingly delivered through local authorities and then implemented through community and youth work. Now, my own background is youth work. I'm a qualified youth worker. I train youth, youth and community workers at Huddersfield University. Uh, and that's how I became involved in researching how Prevent was being implemented in, in the north of England. Um, so that's one important point. The second point and about the prevent one phase is really what has set the public understanding in many ways about the prevent strategy, which was it was only explicitly focused on British Muslim communities. Um, and that was at a time when far right groups such as the English Defence League were growing and having a very profound impact on society. So that perception that it was identifying one community only and doing on a very large scale has really understandably set public perception, even though the reality of prevent has now changed from that. Some of those concerns that Hazel alluded to, such as the work around uh, of Aaron Kundanani about the impact of prevent on Muslim communities, um, prompted the House of Commons Select Committee inquiry around prevent's impacts on community cohesion in 2009. I gave evidence to that, that Select Committee inquiry. And after, the, after the new government coming in 2010, the prevent review fundamentally changed what prevent was in 2011. Firstly, it widened the remit to all forms of extremism. 
but it also very significantly downscaled that community program. Instead, the focus was much more on identifying the vulnerable and referring them into the growing channels channel scheme. So that's quite a profound shift in terms of what Prevent focused on and what it prioritised. And what we've seen with the introduction of the Prevent duty in 2015 is, is a scaling up of that. Of course, what the Prevent review did in 2011 was introduce this concept of fundamental British values. But it was really only the Prevent duties introduction in 2015 that has really operationalised that on a large scale. Um, now, Hazel mentioned the Trojan horse affair, and that was really very much one of the key drivers of why the Prevent duty was introduced. And um, we, we shouldn't underestimate the importance of the prevent duty being imposed in 2050. We're the only country in the world that has a formal legal duty on public sector staff to actually enact counterterrorism measures. So educators and academics in other countries are, are pretty fascinated by this and very interested in what, what it is and how it's playing out. Um, what, what I'm about to go on and talk about is then the research about how that duty has actually been understood. But we, we're, we've now got the independent review that was announced in 2019. Two years later, we're still not very much further forward. And I'm going to say a little bit about that in a moment. So the introduction of the prevent duty and its in, implementation in July 2015 was a very significant moment for educators. It's placed educators and educa educational institutions at the forefront of these wider public controversies around PREVENT. Um, and the, it, it, it refueled many of the controversies about PREVENT stigmatization of, of, of Muslims and Muslim young people, because early examples of referrals from schools seem to very much be inappropriate ones and, and exclusively about Muslim students. Um, but we were very aware as a group of researchers that there is very little um, research evidence, empirical evidence about how educational professionals were actually understanding and enacting, and that word's important, I think Adam's going to be talking about enactment as well, about how they're actually interpreting and, and implementing in educational settings. So the research I'm referring to was carried out with colleagues from Coventry and Durham University. It was the first national study of how the professionals were understanding the duty, and I should stress that our research was about the professionals, about the teachers and other professionals in schools and colleges. It wasn't about how students or their communities understood uh, um, and experienced this. We need more research evidence about that. And we're starting to see that from academic colleagues, but we need more. So, so our research captured the first 18 months of how, how the duty has been implemented in schools and colleges. And we did it through mixed methods research, which involves 70 in-depth individual interviews with professionals in primary and secondary schools and further education colleges, but also a national survey of people who worked in those three sectors where we had 225 completed returns of an in-depth survey. And putting those together, I want to talk briefly about the key findings and particularly in relation to fundamental British values and what it means about pedagogical practice in relation to extremism. So our, our, our overall um, empirical finding, which is a surprise to us as a research team, um, as well as the general public, I think, was that there was actually very little opposition from educational professionals to the prevent duty. Now, that was surprising because educational trade unions had fiercely opposed the prevent duty, as well as sections of, of, of politics and the media. And we found that educators accepted it as a suitable, appropriate, proportionate response to the threat of radicalisation in society. Now, where did, where, where did that acceptance come from? Um, the prevent duty has two key particular sort of elements. One is the idea that prevent should be implemented as part of safeguarding arrangement. It should be viewed as an aspect of safeguarding. Uh, 
the other one is is a curriculum pedagogical one about fundamental British values. So we found the acceptance of pre of the prevent duty was very much about the acceptance of safeguarding. Now, Hazel mentioned the concept of youth vulnerability. We found that educators accepted that there is a vulnerability to radicalization. They understood it as being very similar, uh, comparable to youth vulnerability to other forms of social harm, such as child sexual exploitation, as gang activity, um, both of which were very prevalent in some of the institutions that we re researched in. So that, that comparability of vulnerability, and I accept that this is the nature of vulnerability and how to judge vulnerability is an important issue we might get into in, in debates. Um, but the professionals that we researched with felt it was less important to be able to give a very clear definition of radicalization. They felt as professionals, they could identify what vulnerability was and the nature of how youth vulnerability proceeds. And that's what made them confident they also were confident about the implementation of PREVENT because they are confident about enacting safeguarding overall. They understand safeguarding procedures. They have, they have belief and confidence in the way their institution operates safeguarding and they understand their individual role as an individual professional within it in terms of referring any concern to a designated safeguarding lead, trusting the institution's internal procedures to weigh up that what they understand about that young person and their what the wider picture they have on them and trusting the institution will make a proportionate judgment about whether there is something to then report outwards to channel. So, so that acceptance gave um, a picture from our educational practitioners, our respondents, of actually a great deal of continuity. For, for us from the outside, the implementation, the, the imposition of the prevent duty was seen as a very significant change to, to English education, to schools and colleges. But people working within the schools and colleges said it's actually much more continuity. The change is not significant because we are enacting it and making it work within our existing safeguarding procedures. And in fact, that safeguarding approach, which is well established in, in um, educational institutions and which is, as I said, accepted, that is now being extended within the world of counterterrorism. So recently, the National Counterterrorism Police Headquarters have, um, have launched a campaign called Act Early, which actually draws um, on separate research that we did at Huddersfield with colleagues from Australia, which was about the willingness of people in communities to share concern about someone close to them and intimate becoming radicalised and being vulnerable to radicalisation. And that research has helped inform the, um, the this campaign that has been launched. And it's been very interesting that although Prevent, as we know, is fiercely controversial, there has been very little public sort of controversy over the ACT Early campaign, which suggests that the idea of safeguarding and helping communities and families to keep people they care about safe is accepted, just as it's accepted within educational settings. But what we found was that there was much less educate, educator support for the concept of fundamental British values and much more concern over it. Now, I think, and it's important to make a distinction here, which is that all the educators we researched with said they're entirely comfortable working with and teaching values schools colleges overwhelmingly use values they talk about school values they talk about community values they talk about shared or human or fun or um, universal values what they were concerned with was the fundamental british element of the formulation fundamental because they didn't understand what that represented in relation to sort of preventing extremism it seemed almost an inappropriate word the British values in the sense of in what way are they are they particularly British and they found that that student reaction to the, the idea that these values were British were, was was negative was not helpful because these are clear the idea of democracy the rule of law there's nothing inherently or particularly British about this so 
But at the same time, educators, of course, are inspected by Ofsted and Ofsted do foreground implementation of the prevent duty and of fundamental British values within them. So our research, I think other more recent research by, by other academic colleagues has shown that educators in a way are having to play almost a double game about fundamental British values, that they will talk about values in a more general way and work around them, but they have to explicitly use fundamental British values in terms of like demonstrating to Ofsted that they are talking about that in that explicit terms and that they can demonstrate work around it. But I think what our research also showed and this debate about fundamental British values, as Hazel highlighted, is, is the concern about how limited the focus is on anti-extremism uh, educational dialogue and practice under the under the banner of prevent. Um, Professor Lynn Davis has, has written some really important work about educating against extremism. That's her most well-known book. And she highlights the importance of, of how we need to get complexity into education. If we want to genuinely do educational work against extremism, we have to enable and support educators to do work around complexity, complexity of our own identities and the identities of others, but also the complexity of social and political issues. Um, and at the moment, English British education doesn't help educators to do that, whether through prevent or beyond prevent. Um, we found that educators were wanting more training, more support and more license to actually do such sort of difficult conversations and dialogue work. There is there is um, the Educate Against Hate website that Department for Education um, supports. But obviously, any any materials have to be reinterpreted at the local level by by um, teachers um, and and implemented in in that way. But sorry, Paul, two minutes. OK, a wider context of Prevent is obviously over the last 10 years that citizenship teaching has been significantly downplayed in, in the English educational system. And at Huddersfield, we used to be one of the key centres for training citizenship teaching. So, so that specialist citizenship teaching has now largely sort of disappeared. So one of the things we found was that British values and prevent educational work within schools and colleges was being done, done by all teachers as part of form time, SMSC work, etc. So with some of those teachers feeling very uncomfortable and very unskilled in doing that work. So there is a broader issue about what we're asking educators to do in terms of working against extremism. The last comment really about dialogue about prevent, you know, that was about dialogue within prevent. The prevent review has been really unhelpfully delayed. We need the review for two, two key reasons. One is there are still some issues that we don't know enough about prevent and given its public controversial nature, we need to know more about them in terms of transparency, which is about records, what happens to records. Um, but there's also issues about the very low number of people who are referred who then go, go on to receive the mentoring support from channel. Now, I think that is a defensible sort of proportion um, that goes through, but there hasn't been enough public debate about that. So that's why we need the review. Uh, and we also need the review to focus on what more could prevent do or what could be done in the name of prevent. So it's very regrettable, one, that the prevent review has been profoundly delayed, but also it's highly sort of polarised in terms of how it's been framed. Um, and I will leave it there, Richard. We can maybe pick up some of these broader questions in, in dialogue. Thank you, Professor Thomas. Um, like Hazel, that was Paul, thank you. That was a, a, an excellent presentation. Um, just a couple of comments before I hand over to Adam. I concur totally with your views on the review. Um, just to state that I've submitted an abstract for, for the British Educational Research Association conference in title, is citizenship education dead in England? Question mark. What a horrible question to pose, but again, I'll hopefully debate that virtually in September. Um, and, and just sort of uh, a very quick point about prevent and how it's being taught or significantly not being taught in public, private and voluntary sectors. Uh, I'm very interested, like Paul is, colleagues, in relation to that notion of 
how it's being taught, what is being taught in, in and around prevent? Do you start with anti-radicalization or do you build trust by talking about other issues that the prevent documents, which are now what, seven, eight years old, give us that opportunity to talk about before we get to anti-radicalization? So that's just a few thoughts. Can I also um, uh, encourage people on YouTube to submit their questions or issues for discussion? I think that's really important because after Adam speaks, and I'm going to hand over to Adam in a second, uh, again, we'll have the Q&A, uh, which will be slightly shorter, but I think, than 30 minutes. But um, again, please allow us that latitude for just a few extra minutes for our presentations uh, and our presenters. So thank you again, Paul. And uh, it gives me enormous pleasure to hand over to Adam. Adam, the virtual space is yours. Thank you. All right, good evening, everybody. I hope you can hear me well, <clears throat> and apologies for delay in coming in tonight. I'm going to talk about context. I'm going to talk a little bit about positionality. I'm going to talk a little bit about history of prevent, and I'm going to share with you some of my research findings and some recommendations. But to do all that in 20 minutes is a big ask, so I'll just do parts of it, but I'm going to touch on what Hazel and Paul have said uh, because there's some real interest in, in that. And I'm going to start by just reading you something. In 2015, a parent came to ask my advice about a relative at a school outside of London who had been referred to the Channel Programme, a multi-agency programme which, according to the Home Office, existed to provide support for people vulnerable to being drawn into terrorism. The child had been referred for allegedly speaking up for a Palestinian state in a discussion with fellow pupils. The woman, who was a successful, educated Muslim businesswoman and British citizen, spoke to me of her humiliation, shock and anger that she and her extended family felt, that they no longer believed they were equal citizens in their country. This case confirmed, as I was a head teacher at the time, some of the reservations that I had about the new duty and made me reflect then as a head teacher and teacher and question the policy. My concerns and questions motivated me not only to research the prevent duty in my practitioner position at that time, practically and operational effects, but to consider the need for this very significant and new prevent duty to be researched and studied in a rigorous academic, theoretical and systematic way. And in some small way, I've tried uh, over the last few years to do that because my presentation will share with you some of the key findings from my research that I've done since I've come out of uh, headship, come out of the game. I'm now work, uh, doing some work at UCL and researching there. But in different English secondary schools where I have done research in a variety of geographical regions with different school populations and serving different communities. And this research was done in 2019. Now that seems a long time ago now, doesn't it, in the pandemic, but actually it's not that far away. And it was particularly about leaders and some of my findings do compare and contrast with earlier findings from different academics, um, including Paul actually and, 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 and Hazel. Um, so I'm gonna look at the impact that it's had on schools, particularly on professionalism of school leaders. I did focus on that and concepts such as free speech and securitization. Um, I did interview a range of school leaders of differing experience working in local authority schools, academies, uh, standalone academies, academy chains, mixed and single sex schools, faith schools and schools with post 16 provision. So it's quite extensive reach. And my work illuminates aspects of policy enactment really by school and college leaders. And I conclude by finding really a very mixed and a very messy response to the policy. And um, I, it, it does challenge what some uh, scholars have previously said about prevent and, uh, uh, and contrasting that perhaps with fundamental British values. But I utilized in my work, the, the, the work of Stephen Ball on policy enactment and um, some aspects of his and others work, scholars on, for example, actor positions, how people play out their role and I draw on particularly recent work of Carol Vincent at uh, UCL when she's looked particularly at fundamental British values. So that's some of what I'm going to talk about um, today. Um, just to, on the positionality, I think this is quite important because all of the speakers tonight were all middle class of a certain age. Well, probably I'm a bit older than most of you, but 
we're white privilege. And to me, that is one of the reasons I came in to look at it because of my practitioner hat on. But I think it's very important as we move forward and actually at the moment, how we listen to other voices and other researchers of different cultural backgrounds on their perspective on this. And um, I've been very interested in critical race theory as a way of looking into subjects. And I think that there's enormous scope to consider this particular policy and the way it's it been enacted and impacted through that lens. Um, I chose not to do that for a variety of reasons, but I think positionality is important. And just so that you get a bit of an idea of that, um, my own context is that for over 30 years, I was a London secondary teacher, citizenship teacher, history teacher. And for 20 of those, I was a secondary school leader working in a range of diverse West London schools. Um, I ended up as a head. And as a school leader, I was used to implementing and managing policy. I chaired the Association of School and College Leaders who have supported me in my research here, actually. Um, I, 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 I chaired their public and parliamentary committee. So I was asked actually to be part of the um, consultation led by the Home Office in advance of the 2015 uh, legislation. I wasn't very happy with it. I'll be quite frank with that consultation. I wasn't very happy with the outcomes of it. I wasn't very happy that they were listening to concerned voices that were being raised at that time within the uh, within schools and colleges. It's not just within the wider community. And since uh, then I've been quite engaged in talking and speaking and, and, and working with groups of young people. And I work in my local community over the summer with a group of young people on the Black Lives Matters project and, and so on. So I kept my hand in there as it were. So that's the first thing. I wanna just quickly say something about the context if I may, because I know that, that some questions were raised when the sort of flyer came out to do with this, uh, this evening. So first of all, citizenship. Hazel and Paul have mentioned that. Um, I've been involved in it with a group actually from UCL during, during the lockdown uh, on reimagining what citizenship education could look like. But I just uh, raise this with you. Obviously, fundamental duty of the government is to look after its citizens. We're seeing that around the world at the moment with the pandemic, or not seeing it. But also, I think you go back to Hobbes, don't you, when he talks about protecting citizens from violence. So we've got to be looking at the realities of what has been going on in our in our world but I also just raised Shamina Begum with you she was 15 when she went to Syria I think the High Court is going to judge next week as whether she can come back here and uh, because she's had her citizen stripped from her so that's a sort of context in in which we're working the statutory review both Hazel and Paul have mentioned that very quickly, it's been mired as in controversy and it's been put out into the long grass and so on. Lord Carlisle, now William Shawcross with his links to Policy Exchange and the Henry Jackson Society and so on. And I noticed Neil Basu, who is uh, a leading uh, 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 Metropolitan Police Officer actually, has actually said just in this week that he prefer it if the groups that have, operate, have decided to um, not be involved in the uh, statutory review, and there's a large number, aren't there? Amnesty, um, right the way through to the Runnymede Trust. Uh, if they don't, if they're not engaged in this review, it, 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 it's, its credibility is very much diminished. So that's another factor. Another factor is that you may have read this week the Commission for Countering Extremism report that came out two days ago, with uh, 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 some interesting. Uh, 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 talk about um, hateful extremism and what we should or shouldn't be doing about that. So that's another dynamic that's playing out as we speak at the moment. And I just raised the question, should there be a prevent duty? Many people would say no, that they see it as a toxic totem pole, don't they? With a chilling effect on freedom of speech, at suspect communities and so on. But there are others that say they should for the safety and because of the continuity of the, of the policy. But what should the policy be like if it's changed and it's reviewed? And I've got some suggestions on that. I do wanna mention the pandemic, if you don't mind, tonight as we're sitting here. I mean, for me, some people seem to almost think that we're out of the pandemic. When, you, when you're listening to discussions today, 
uh, about the education sort of catch up plan and so on. But Foucault right, wrote some years ago about pandemics being revelatory. They don't lead always to transformation. And I think that's our watchword as we look at coming out of the pandemic and also in relationship to uh, what we're talking about tonight, the prevent duty. But look how groups have disproportionately suffered during the pandemic, particularly BAME groups. And um, I mean, I live in uh, West London, I live in uh, Shepherd's Bush, and uh, I've been working within our community trying to uh, encourage people to go to, for, to be tested, but also now to go and actually be inoculated. And a lot of our community won't do it. They don't want to do it, not just because of what they've read on uh, a social media, but because of their inherent really suspicion of authority and concerns. And I've done some research with the elders in the community here about their perspective about prevent and how it's impacted upon their grandchildren, basically. And it's very uh, illuminating to hear uh, their concerns and, uh, and what they say. So we do need to be very careful. And Edom, the, I looked this up the other day, the Freedom uh, Home US NGO organization, not exactly radical, they found that in over 80 countries where the quality of democracy and human rights has gone down significantly since the pandemic began. So I think we need to look at those in that because I, I spent a lot of time and I'm not gonna talk about it tonight about the rise of populism and the age of anger, uh, which I think is a real, we are in that period. And I think that's uh, has defined uh, the discourse uh, uh, both at a government level, but also at the media level about all these things. Far right extremism. Um, you, uh, my research, uh, and I'll briefly tell you in a minute, goes back to the Oklahoma bombings because there is a continuum between, and as Hazel was saying, between Timothy McVeigh and the Proud Boys. Uh, 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 this idea that they're, they're lone wolf, sort of uh, radical right wingers out there that occasionally do something is, is, a, is a nonsense, really. There, uh, there's a systematic sis, uh, 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 history of that that's just taking place, not just in America, but, uh, but in Europe and in, in, in this country. Um, muscular liberalism the, uh, uh, is, is, has shaped our, our policy, uh, 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 particularly in schools, but also elsewhere with um, the prevent duty and fundamental British values and shaped the discourse since uh, David Cameron spoke at the Munich Security Conference, and that did change uh, uh, the prevent duty. There's no doubt about that. And you can read what Secretary of State for Education wrote uh, a few years before that, Michael Gove, in, 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 in his, his writings about uh, uh, concerns in that respect. I quite like this term, liberal illiberalism. Uh, Moffitt 2017. And uh, I say that because I think it's 100 years since John Rawls uh, 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 was born. And obviously the idea of political liberalism uh, 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 and those concepts, are they still there for the world in which we live? Has this age of anger uh, 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 taken over those? And um, as I said, I mentioned Carol Vincent, she's got a recent paper which is titled The Illiberalism of Liberalism. So there we go, it's, it's juxtaposing those. But I think we need to see it in those contexts. I've mentioned about my positionality, very briefly on the history, many scholars, and uh, Paul was mentioning this earlier, um, and within the literature, talk about these two phases. And uh, I accept those two phases, but in my work, I've tried to go a bit beyond that. I've come up with five phases. And, I, and another time I can talk more about that. The first is a preface. And I start in 1995 with the Oklahoma bombing. And I track through not just the, the, what's been going on around the world, but I also track through some of the research that's taken place within the whole counterterrorism uh, field um, and to summarize that research. So that's the sort of uh, a phase that I call the emergence of new terrorism. There's a second phase from 9-11 to 7-7, the war on terror. And I call that the move from protection to prevention. Then we go from 7-7 until 2011, David Cameron's speech as prime minister. And I call that 
focus on homegrown terrorism. Let me go to phase four, 2011 until the Manchester bombings, the growth of securitization. And with all those other events that occurred at that time until the present, we're talking about this new focus of prevent. So Sorry, Adam, two minutes. Two minutes, right, there we go. What did my research show? Very quickly, it showed there were positive views and criticisms of the prevent duty within school and college leaders. It was not simply enough to say that they accepted it. I found some leaders that wouldn't use the term within their institutions and uh, were very critical of it. Safeguarding, we talked about that earlier. I found very much the tension between autonomy and accountability with school leaders, this real tension about where do you get the balance? And I was watching Newsnight last night with Michael Wiltshire, former Chief Inspector of Schools. He only took about five minutes before he talked about how you would inspect the new uh, policies that were, that were being brought in to catch up uh, young people in their schools. So there's a tension there between monitoring and giving uh, school leaders and teachers autonomy. Free speech. Has it actually had that chilling effect? I'm not going to have enough time to tell you. I found many examples of where it has actually opened up a space for discussion. Now, what's interesting is that teachers and the particularly school leaders are telling me that. I wanted to cross-reference that with the young people to see actually whether they felt the same. Whether they felt the same. Because one of the dynamics I picked up very early on was young people were not talking about issues such as this within their schools. They were told by their families not to, not to engage in discussions about issues to do with terrorism, 9-11 or prevent. I found an increase, I, I found very interesting this idea of sense making, how school leaders would adapt a new sense making. Because I interviewed, I haven't really explained this very well, but I interviewed experienced school leaders. And then I went to a second cohort of more junior uh, school leaders who actually did represent a wide range of uh, cultural diversity as well. But that very strongly came through, this idea of how do you make, it, how do you make sense of a policy? Securitization, the increase of that. Although interesting, leaders did not feel themselves that they had been securitized. They believed that the systems that they're working in had, but for themselves. Responsibilitization, uh, uh, that comes up very strongly in the work that Paul has done. And that clearly you could see strong evidence of that, of where professionals are being made responsible now for these actions. Strong professional concerns about the whole issue to do with prevent. Strong concerns about training, not just training at the beginning, but also all the way through. And also, um, a real sense of placing this duty within Mishra's age of anger. So in the last minute that I've got, I would, my recommendations would, I would suggest there should be a full review of the prevent duty. I suggest there should be a review of the Ofsted framework with regarding to inspecting the prevent duty. I believe there should be a re-examination of safeguarding how it's constituted because safeguarding in its first instance was to deal with individual young people and their well-being and safety. Prevent is a strategy to deal with wider terrorist groups. And there seems to be a need for some decoupling of that. I, my research shows a recognition of localism, the very, very importance of looking at what's going on in Greater Manchester, looking at what's going on in Kent, looking at what's going on in Sussex, looking at what's going on in different parts of London. And this is very important, I think, when we're looking at the way the pandemic has played out in policy, that tension between national and localism. And finally, uh, training for school leaders. There's a, a, a real uh, need for uh, experienced proper training and entitlement training uh, for all school leaders, which no longer exists, and sharing of good practice within institutions, uh, particularly with regard to free speech. And then my final point I'll make was that every school leader that I interviewed, and I said, I went up and down the country to do this, 
they all thanked me for coming to visit them and interview them. Now, as an ex-practitioner, I was quite humbled by that. I was quite moved by that, actually. And I could sense why they did it, because they told me that they'd been given a space in which to talk about a very sensitive, a very controversial subject. They opened up to me in a way that I think uh, uh, gave me some very interesting findings. But there's a need for us to create those opportunities with school leaders, that's where my research was, but with others, that space to allow themselves to reflect on their professionalism, but also on the job that they are endeavouring to do in these very challenging and difficult times. So that's a quick look at some of the aspects of what I've done. I've tried to pitch it in a slightly different way, uh, coming third uh, in the session tonight, but I'm very happy to talk and answer any questions on more detail to that in a moment. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Adam. Um, and again, it's refreshing to hear critical race, a critical race theory methodology being used, having taught critical race theory last night. So it's always a pleasure to hear that autobiographical um, reflection. Um, and again, um, a very good paper with lots and lots of issues. Now, looking at the time, everybody, we've got about 20 minutes for Q&A. And Lysha has sent me through some questions. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to bring back our three speakers um, to address sort of one question each. Uh, and Hazel, I think I will start with you asking the question. Um, let's have a look. Um, some argue that the idea of fundamental British values fields into broader narratives of Britishness, which played a significant role in Brexit thinking what's going on in the union at the moment do you share this view um, <clears throat> well partially i do um I mean, what i'd like to do is to is to answer that but also draw in some of the others as well if i may um because i think there's been a well we can track um the evolution if you like of the um the, the notion of Britishness and the way we now see Britishness in the teacher standards in the prevent duty, the notion of fundamental British values, but we can track this back. Um, indeed, we've done so in, in, in our book on fundamental British values. Um, and so, you know, uh, I don't think things have suddenly appeared. I don't think this concept has suddenly appeared. But I think there has been a very clear um, policy alignment with the notion of Britishness. And if you like, a desire to um, hold on to that and develop it. So, uh, you know, uh, some years ago, um, Ruth Kelly and Liam Byrne were working around um, the notion of Britishness, a proposal through a Fabian pamphlet, a, an idea for Empire Day, bringing back Empire Day. These things have been around for some time and have, you know, worked their way through the system. I think there have been some really interesting um, evolutions of this notion. Um, I think there's um, a, a real need for um, a serious debate around the way in which we understand British values and the way we understand British, because, um, you know, th there's another question here, which is around, um, you know, this being a, a government uh, determined agenda, if you like. And, um, and I go back to my presentation and my final comments, which is that Homie Barber really helps us here to, to challenge the, you know, a sort of um, a single narrative around Britishness. Uh, and rather to hold on to something that interrupts that single narrative and is much richer. So I, for one, um, I'm all for um, having a much richer debate around um, the notion of Britishness. Um, I don't think we necessarily have to wrestle it from <laughs> politicians. I think it's better to work uh, together on these things. Um, but I, I do think the time is right to have um, a rich uh, and open discussion around uh, the concept of Britishness and British values. Thank you, Hazel. Um, Paul, do you have anything to add to that in relation to FBV? Well, only that I'd agree with Hazel about, you know, it's a curious journey from Gordon Brown's debates in the early 2000s and David Blunkett's about the importance of Britishness, you know, building on the Crick report. And it was about as a multicultural, multiracial society, we need to promote and build a Britishness that reflects that and is cognizant of that. And that's very different from where we've got now with this list of fundamental British values that's a government dictated list. Um, 
but I suppose I've personally got some sympathy to that brown pers- perspective as society changes. Mm-hmm. It's naive to think you don't have to work and support the notion <clears throat> of national identity. And we certainly found in our in our research that some of the schools that are heavily um, ethnic minority, most mostly non-white children, a lot they found that FBV had actually helped them with the support of the majority of parents to do more overt things about Britishness. Now, a minority of parents were not supportive of that in, as they reported to us, but a lot were actually very supportive of it and welcomed it. And um, the communities that have the biggest support for British identity are actually our non-white minority communities. Mm-hmm. Now, English identity, which I've done re- separate research around, is a very different kettle of fish, and we could get into that. But at times, I think, if I can say white liberals, at times there may be struggle more with Britishness than maybe non-white British citizens. And that notion of British... Britishness, I think, is, is incredibly complicated. Again, within my teaching next week, first question I will pose to my students in that virtual seminar is what is Britain in February 2021? Mm-hmm. And again, just adding to that before we move to Adam, again, in the United Kingdom, we have four countries and four different systems of education. And again, a lot of my students don't know that. Again, just across the border in Wales, they have a bilingual system of education. I'm, I'm the first generation to not speak Welsh in my family. My parents are Welsh speakers. So. There you go. And that's even before we look at Scotland, let alone Northern Ireland. Wow. Adam, any more thoughts on FBV? A couple of thoughts. Um, there might have been a view. It's not very British to have fundamental British values. You know, we're no. all <laughs> a cup of tea and, and so on. And Carol Vincent's work uh, is very interesting on on that. I also just refer you to a book, but uh, I forgot the title now, but Danny Dawling and Sally Tomlinson, they brought it out about uh, two years ago. It was about Brexit, basically, and it was about linking it to lots of things, including the empire. Um, <clears throat> very interesting. I, I, I think that actually I, I placed Brexit within this age of anger. and I think it's something that was missed. I think we should have seen it more. Uh, both uh, uh, educationists, but also academics. I think universities missed it. I went to a a, a debate about Brexit, actually, I remember this, at UCL, um, and not one person spoke in favour of Brexit. And I actually put my hand up and said, do you not think we ought to be discussing this? Because quite a lot of people do think we should leave. And there was an assumption that we wouldn't. Um, And there were ministers and all sorts there. So I think we missed something there. With the fundamental British values, I think we should not underestimate the teacher agency in terms of how they've shaped fundamental British values as both uh, 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 um, uh, our colleagues were saying just now. Um, but fundamental British values have been more controversial on, on first look than prevent duty within teachers and school leaders. Although my research does show there's quite a lot of concern about the prevent duty. It's not been universally accepted and there is a real appetite for it to be changed. So uh, yes, um, I think we didn't, we need to look at Britain today, the, the union, what does the union mean? And the, uh, 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 and the challenges to the union now with Brexit. Um, but I could see why people did vote to leave. And I think we should respect that. Uh, um, and um, therefore work out what, what our place is in the world, but what, our, what, what does it mean to be a citizen in the UK? in 2021 and and going forward for young people. I think that's very important. I think that's a very important point. We've got to have those difficult conversations, haven't we? In the sense that if we think of America, 70 million people voted for former President Trump. In that sense, again, if you're thinking of American history, if you go back, if you're looking at it through a multicultural lens, you're looking at um, segregation, you're looking at slavery, and you're also looking at American history before uh, the Americans kicked the British out. And you're talking about 10,000 years of history there in relation to indigenous tribes throughout the Americas, not just <laughs> what is now Canada, the USA and Mexico, and even further down into Central and South America. But the history is rich and it sort of gets me thinking about sort of colonialization and that story before you even get to post-colonialism. When you think of in a British sense, you think about England and even, even before England went north to Scotland, west to Wales and across the Irish Sea to Ireland. Again, um, 
even, it's very strange, isn't it? 1066, how has this come up? But of course, um, that's where it seems to start. And of course, that was when um, what was, well, what is now Britain was invaded by the, by the Normans, the French. So in that sense, again, do we, do we actually, within Britishness, do we, we, do we underline the complexities of, of Britain and, and its stories, let alone its national story within a national curriculum? I mean, just drawing us back in, sorry about that tangent, everybody, but coming back in to prevent, Adam, I liked your idea of Ofsted having an independent review of um, prevent, because of course, Ofsted are independent. So in that sense, again, well, look, stop laughing, Adam. Um, it's, it's, <laughs> they are. And, and in that sense, would, would you think that Ofsted perhaps are a better vehicle than the DFE to, to submit uh, evidence within the current prevent review? Well, I think that's one point. Yes, I think they could, and they could pick up some good practice. Um, and uh, there is good practice and concerns as well. I, I think I was also trying to talk about a decoupling uh, of the way in which uh, schools are looked at and whether we should be moving, because we've moved into this intense securitized system and coming out of the pandemic as well. Should we remind ourselves of some basic tenets of education and some of the other things that have to go on within our schools and colleges as well? And are they different? And should they be looked at differently? And I think that's probably, probably what I'm trying to say. I mean, I, I didn't have enough time to talk about safeguarding, but every single school leader I spoke to uh, uh, would bring me great uh, uh, files showing where they placed the prevent duty. And they were almost treating me when I first went in like I was an Ofsted inspector. And I sort of said, no, 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 no. Uh, uh, but they wanted to show me where they'd located it. And they had all located it in safeguarding. That's where they're told to put it, of course. And my question really is, should it be there? I don't think it should be, actually. And I think we need to reappraise what, what we mean by safeguarding. Safeguarding is a, is a box where lo lots of things are put there nowadays. And I suppose what I'm trying to say in answer to your question Richard, is that we need to, do we need to try and decouple some of these things? And do, uh, do we need to, if we, ha we have to uh, uh, inspect them, if we do, which we do, of course, uh, how do we do that? And do we have the same body doing all of that? You know, checking what uh, a geography lesson is like, as opposed to what, uh, uh, the, how many people have been referred to uh, through the prevent duty. Are they the same thing? Uh, perhaps they are but perhaps they're not. That's what I'm questioning. Thank you, Adam. Again, I'm gonna move back to Paul and Hazel for a question from Jeremy Rogel. Thank you, Jeremy, for the question. Uh, he, he argues we are familiar with threats from jihadi and far-right extremism, but what are speakers' views on the category of prevent referrals? 38% classed as mixed, unstable or unclear ideology. Paul, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely the category that is growing very rapidly. Um, but I think it also gives some sense of modern vulnerability. I use the word vulnerability advisably because you know, both Adam and Hazel have rightly raised issues about that and the way safeguarding frames things. But conspiracy theories are becoming increasingly rife. I mean, we're, barely, we're still only just starting to understand what social media and the internet do in terms of our culture. We see results, but we're only just understanding it. And I think there are, I, there are ideologies and conspiracy theories that don't fit neatly into frames and people are picking these up. They're sharing these. And um, I think we've got to use to prevent being about very clear and stable ideologies and actually it's you know I suppose I defend the concept of vulnerability um, vulnerability to types of, of, of thinking and types of beliefs or conspiracies that, that that fit people's emotional state and draw them towards them that give them answers but they don't necessarily fit into clear ideological sort of concepts that I was taught on a political science undergraduate degree. It's interesting, isn't it? That uh, I think going back to Jeremy's point here, that um, within the review and bringing that back into the conversation, um, perhaps those categories have got to be reviewed. And I'm hoping that um, people that are listening tonight and even some of the presenters 
or contribute to the review in that sense. Go on, Paul. No, I was just, just going to say, going to say that you know Adam mentioned talking to a head teacher and they could sense when a, when a young person is heading that direction. Maybe it's not about the ideas. Maybe it's more about their feeling, their emotional state, their their needs, their lacks, and um, yeah. Thank you, Hazel. Your thoughts, please. Yeah, I, I just pick up on uh, the notion of um, safeguarding and also the construct or the concept of the vulnerable. <clears throat> I think one of the reasons that um, uh, this needs to be um, interrogated, I think, further um, is because one of the things that we hold dear as educators in the relationship with the learner um, is the construct of the learner as an empowered member of the school community. Um, and that's really important for us in pedagogic terms. It's important in the way in which we construct the learner, not as a deficit model, not as uh, somebody who has to learn from us, but rather an empowered young person. And the pedagogic processes that we employ in schools, um, the ways we engage with text, the way we support young people to engage one with another, these are all um, means by which we empower young people. So on the one hand, we have this notion of emp the empowered young person and all the things we do to empower that young person in pedagogic terms as teachers. And then we have the notion of the construct of the vulnerable and the way in which safeguarding is constructing the vulnerable in more and different ways. And I think there's a point at which we need to just pause and look at that one in relation to the other. Thank you, Hazel, uh, to pause and reflect on the issues that we've uh, all discussed this evening. Um, we've got a few minutes left, everybody. So before I hand back to uh, Lisa, just a couple of points, everybody. At the beginning of tonight's session, we've already had communication with several, well, with several people that want to continue the dialogue here. The title of this session was Evolving Dialogue. So if you are interested in participating um, in a future, perhaps round table, Hopefully it will be face-to-face -face later on in the year, but uh, let's just call it virtual for now and keep our fingers and toes crossed. Uh, please contact myself or the Dialogue Society. My email address is r.race at rohampton.ac.uk. Um, if you want to communicate with the speakers this evening, again, Professor Brian and Professor Thomas are both at Huddersfield University. If you would like um, to contact them, I can forward on with their permission, their email address. Uh, to communicate in relation to their publication. It's not just the books, it's the journal articles as well that are fascinating. Um, and in that sense, the same uh, invitation goes to Adam as well at UCL. So if you want to communicate with Adam um, and for whatever, whatever reason can't find his email address, I have it and with Adam's permission, um, I'll forward on uh, the communication to him. Uh, personally, I'd like to thank Hazel, Paul and Adam for their fascinating thoughts on prevent and fundamental British values. Again, ap apologies, Adam, for the technical issues. We got you in eventually. Um, but um, thank you to the Dialogue Society on behalf of all of us this evening. I think that's the, that's the important way to end. So I will hand back to Lysha to finish um, this evening's um, seminar. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for attending uh, and thank you for listening. We hope that you've increased your understandings this evening. Uh, of prevent and fundamental uh, British values and let the dialogues uh, continue to evolve. Lasha. Yeah, um, thank you very much, Richard, for, for chairing so beautifully. And, and I think you ended on a very nice point of you know continuing with with the dialogue and I think it's it's within the nature of dialogue itself to, to have that continued um, but but for that to hopefully be inspired by by this panel discussion to continue um, as you mentioned, you know, fingers fingers crossed in in person as well, uh, as as the months go on would would be beautiful. And and please do you know get in contact with us any any of the viewers at the moment who who want to do that, um, and we'll we'll be in touch with you. Um, you know, likewise, I wanted to thank Hazel, Paul, and and Adam for being here with us this evening and and engaging such critical and and also enlightening discussions. You know, both with your own presentations and also with, with the Q&A session um, at, at the end. Uh, yeah, like, like, like I said, I think it's you know time to kind of wrap up now um, and, and hopefully uh, we'll, we'll be in person next time, but, but just in case we're not, you know, do, do feel free to kind of subscribe to the channel 
um, and, and hopefully it will update you with, with notifications when, when future uh, events do arise. And then we have some interesting ones coming up. You know, as I mentioned, uh, I think that the latest one will be um, the UN Women Empowerment Panel that, that we'll be participating in and presenting some of our own research. Um, and that's very exciting for, for us as, as researchers here at, at Dialogue Society. Um, so thank you very much to, to all our contributors today. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening and, and looking forward to, to furthering dialogue as well.